Today we're talking about chapter 10, which is the development of evolutionary theory. In this video, we're just focusing on sections one through three, and in the next video in the series, we will finish up the rest of the chapter. So we're going to talk first about some of the scientists that proposed early ideas about the theory of evolution, but before we do that, we need to define what evolution actually is. Evolution is a biological process of change, and in evolution, we're talking about how the descendants are different or they have changed from what the ancestors were. The simple way of saying this, the simplest definition you can have for evolution is that it is a change in a species over time. Very important to note that it is not an individual that evolves. It is not an individual horse ancestor that stretches its legs longer or loses its toes to become the modern horse. It's all about an entire species leaving behind offspring and the traits that become common in the offspring are the traits that you see developing in the species as a whole. So what that would look like, let's stick with the horse example. We have the ancestor of the horse, much smaller than a modern day horse, about the size of a dog. Well, it's not this individual that grew and then gave birth to offspring that were taller. The variation in offspring meant that some of the offspring were taller than others, and if the tall offspring had an advantage, then that trait would be passed down more often than the short trait. So we see this happening over generation after generation through millions of years until we get to the much larger size of the horse that we see today. You can make the same kind of argument for skull shape or even the shape of the toe. Notice how in the ancestor of the horse, there were three separate toes. The two side toes became reduced over time until eventually in our modern day horse, it looks like what we would expect with a single toe with the hoof at the end. So the idea of evolution really became prominent in the 18th century. And the three scientists you see on the screen here were three really important early scientists that all had their ideas about evolution. Now at this time, everybody, to include the scientists, really believed that God or some sort of creator had placed all of the species on earth in their current form. And the church was actually teaching that these species did not change over time. They had always existed in this current form. So it was pretty controversial then when these scientists like Lamarck or Wallace or Darwin, they started to say, well, according to what we've noticed, it seems like these species would have changed over time. So the idea of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, he was a French scientist. He had the idea that species could evolve, that there was this change over time, but he did not know how that could happen. And he actually had the wrong mechanism or the way that evolution occurred. His idea was the idea of use and disuse. Basically, if an individual used a specific body part, Lamarck thought that that would get stronger or larger, and then they would pass that down to their offspring. And on the flip side, if they didn't use something, then it would just kind of shrivel up and disappear. Well, we know that's not the way it works because that's not how genetics and inheritance works. Um, Lamarck didn't know about genes, so it wasn't really his fault that he didn't know that. But definitely with our current understanding, we know that this is not the way evolution occurs. An example of what Lamarck might have said for evolution would be a giraffe that needed to reach the leaves at the top of the tree would stretch its neck out and after stretching its neck over many years it would eventually have a longer neck it would have offspring that would have longer necks and that would be how the species of giraffe got a long neck now obviously that is not the way that it works the next two scientists alfred russell wallace and charles darwin those two scientists both had essentially the exact same idea about evolution. And that idea is what we call survival of the fittest or natural selection. They noticed that there was naturally occurring variation among the individuals of a species. 
and that meant some of them could survive better than others. Well, the ones that survived could pass down their genes to their offspring, and therefore the offspring would inherit those traits from their parents. So Wallace and Darwin that you see here got the right mechanism. They figured out that it had to be inheritance of traits from parents that would explain why these traits became more common in a species rather than the idea of use and disuse. There were also some really important geologists that contributed to the theory of biological evolution. And that's because in geology, scientists had already been studying how changes would occur very slowly over time. And so some of the ideas put forth by the geologists were very important in providing evidence or ideas for how biological evolution could occur. Our first geologic idea is catastrophism. And this is the idea that geologic formations are shaped by natural disasters. Well, if it's possible for a volcano or a mass flooding event to change geologic formations, then certainly these scientists thought it would be possible for the environment to shape living species as well. Gradualism is the second idea, and this is the idea that geologic changes happened gradually over time. Kind of that idea of massively long periods of geologic time, talking about millions of years. If we're talking about how long it would take for a river to cut the Grand Canyon, it has to erode its way through all those layers of rock. That's the idea of gradualism. And so again, if it happens in geology, then it stands to reason that in biology, species could gradually change over time as well. And finally, our third geologic idea is uniformitarianism. And that's the idea that geologic processes that we observe today are the same processes that happened in the past. So the way that rock erodes today or the way that igneous rock is formed from molten magma, that happened the same in the past as it is today. And again, that makes it very helpful for a biologist because if we're studying living species alive today, we can say, well, the way these species work and interact is probably very similar to how ancient species would have done the same. All right, our next section is all about Charles Darwin and his voyage on the HMS Beagle, which is the ship that you see pictured here. He basically sailed around the entire world, took about five years, and he made all of these stops along the way, studying plants, animals, and fossils. Uh, whatever he could study at each location, he did. He took lots of notes, he made lots of collections, and this was really pivotal in him coming up with the theory of evolution by natural selection. So he made some really important observations. The first one is that the organisms on the islands, the Galapagos Islands, he's famous for studying those organisms. And he noticed that they seem to be similar to each other but have some differences from one island to the next. He figured that they must have descended from some ancestral mainland species and then diversified once they made it to each island. And examples of this would be the tortoises that have different shaped of shells on the different islands. The finches that he studied, he noticed that they had different shaped beaks and each finch beak was well suited for whatever food source was available on that island for the finch to eat. He also made some fossil observations. He noticed that fossils of extinct animals were pretty similar to some of the modern species. Uh, he famously found some fossils of an extinct armadillo relative. This is a glyptodon that you see here. And noticed that, hey, that guy looks pretty similar to an armadillo. He noticed that there were fossilized seashells that were high in the Andes Mountains. Well, there's no ocean in the Andes Mountains, at least not today. So that was further evidence that there had been this massive change in environment over time. 
And if the environment had changed that massively, the species that were living in the environment had probably changed as well. So basically he took all of the ideas from the observations that he made and he concluded that the earth was definitely changing over time. There had been some pretty massive changes and that was present in the fossil record. It's present in geologic formations. And so he thought it must be happening in living species as well. So his conclusion, the idea he came up with, he called it descent with modification. And that simply means that the descendants from an ancestor were slightly different. There were gradual changes that happened over time that made the descendants different or modified from what the ancestor looked like. And the last part of chapter 10 is section three. This is going to be all about the idea of natural selection that was proposed by Darwin and also Alfred Russell Wallace. There were several insights that led Darwin and Wallace to this idea. And obviously the first insight was everything that they had learned on the voyage up to this point. Both Wallace and Darwin had traveled around to different places of the world and made lots of key observations. But Darwin, when he came back from his voyage, he was interested in the breeding of pigeons. And this is a hobby that many people at the time were participating in. And Darwin noticed that if he selected pigeons with certain traits and bred them together, the offspring would inherit those traits. This is the idea of artificial selection. If humans are choosing which members of a population get to breed with each other, that is artificial selection. It's not nature deciding who's best suited, it's humans deciding, oh, you have the trait that I'm interested in, I'm gonna breed you together with this other organism over here. But what Darwin learned from this is that it is definitely possible for traits to show up in the offspring of parents if those parents also have those traits. So he was getting at that idea of heritability even though Darwin himself did not know about DNA or genes. So that led to the idea of natural selection and natural selection defined, it is simply a mechanism. A mechanism is the way something happens. Mechanism by which individuals that have inherited beneficial adaptations produce more offspring than the others. So if you inherit beneficial traits, you leave behind more offspring because those traits were heritable, the offspring are inheriting them as well. So over time, more and more offspring will have these beneficial traits. So you'll notice that idea of heritability is super important. You can't have natural selection of a trait if it is unable to be passed down, if it's not coded for in your genes. So Darwin noticed that this heritability was important through his artificial breeding experiments. And he proposed natural selection, otherwise known as survival of the fittest, and said that whatever the most fit organisms were, those were gonna pass down their traits to their offspring. So when we're talking about biological fitness, we don't mean fitness like going to the gym and working out and being strong or fast. Biological fitness is all about ability to produce offspring. An organism can be very slow and very weak, but if it happens to leave behind a lot of offspring, it would be considered very biologically fit. So let's talk about the four principles of natural selection. These are the, the four principles that Darwin built the idea of natural selection around. First one, overproduction. This one is simple. It just means that more offspring are produced than can possibly survive. So if you have lots of offspring, what's going to happen? There will be competition among the offspring and among the individuals of the population. The example that your textbook uses for these four principles has to do with the jaguar here. We have the mother, we have two cubs. This is overproduction because it is very likely that in a natural environment, 
both of those cubs are not going to survive. Only one would be able to get the resources that it needs to stay healthy and outlive the other. Our next principle is variation, and this is genetic variation. Something that Wallace and Darwin both noticed when they sailed around the world studying lots of different types of organisms is that in every population, there was naturally occurring variation. Well, this is important for natural selection because remember, in natural selection, some traits are beneficial and some are not. So you have to have variation among the offspring in order for some of them to have beneficial traits that can be selected for and become more common through natural selection. So if we look at these two jaguar cubs, they are now all grown up. There is variation in the skull shape. So the strength of the jaw, the attachment of the jaw bones, the strength and, and the length of the teeth. And that natural variation is something that can be acted upon by natural selection. Our next principle is adaptation, not adaption. It's pronounced adaptation. And adaptation is a feature of a species that is beneficial. So in our jaguar example, we're talking about the large jaws with the strong muscle attachment. We're talking about the strong teeth that are able to puncture the shelled reptiles like a turtle. Those are adaptations that give a jaguar a survival advantage. Jaguars that have those strong jaws and teeth are more likely to survive because they have more food options. They would be able to eat more than a jaguar that had a weaker jaw. Um, the other jaguars might only be able to eat mammals, but the jaguar with the really strong jaw and teeth could expand their food source to include the turtle. And finally, our fourth principle of natural selection is descent with modification. We did talk about that one earlier. And this is just the idea here for the jaguar. Those adaptations, the traits that were beneficial, they are heritable, meaning they can be passed down. So they are going to become more and more common in the descendants of the ancestor. And hence, our descendants are going to be slightly modified or descent with modification when you compare those descendants back to the original ancestor. One final thought before I leave you is that natural selection is limited because it can only act on variation that already exists. Remember, Lamarck did not write, have the right idea about evolution. Lamarck thought that an organism could produce a new trait out of need, but that actually cannot occur. Natural selection can only work with what's already there. So what that means is that sometimes a structure can take on a completely new function that's different from the way it originally functioned. Whenever that happens, that is called an exaptation. And a really interesting example of that is the thumb, which is actually just a wrist bone, on a panda. So pandas have five digits. You can see one, two, three, four, Five. So those are the four fingers and thumbs, so to speak. But then there is this structure here that looks very much like a thumb, but this is just an overgrown wrist bone that would be a part of all the other bones in the wrist that was able to serve a purpose that provided a beneficial trait, and that means that that trait got passed down to the next generation and the generation after that. So this would be an exaptation because the original function was just a bone in the wrist for the movement of the hand. But it has taken on a new function and that is to serve as kind of a thumb or a support structure as the panda is holding that bamboo that it is eating for a food source. So that's a really good example of how natural selection did not create that thumb out of need there was a bone that was already there, maybe something in the regulation of that bone development, the gene got switched on, the bone grew longer than it was supposed to, 
but that ended up being a beneficial trait that got passed down to the offspring. So that's going to be the end of our discussion of natural selection. Again, we will finish up the rest of chapter 10 in the next video if you are looking for more of the evidence of evolution that's found later on in the chapter. Hopefully you found this to be helpful, and if you have any questions, please make sure that you ask those in class.